Let's uh, turn once again to uh, Psalm 100. That's the text that I read last night. But of course, we have uh, great testimonies. And so uh, I'm going to explain what I read last night. So let me read the text again. Psalm 100, verse 1. Let the whole earth shout triumphantly to the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Say joyful songs. God, God preferred joyful songs. That's why I, I believe those uh, hymns should be, should be uh, how do you call that? When you write it again? Rearranged, yeah. And into something more, more joyful. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his people, the ship of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Did you guys enter this church today with Thanksgiving? Amen. Amen. Uh, Barry Tubbs said to us, what's up with you guys? You don't say amen. But during the worship, he said, he, he noticed the, the, the joyful sound that is coming out of your lips. Amen? amen? Praise God. That sounds like you charge a lot in your credit cards, guys. You know. <laughs> Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his faithful love endures forever. His faithfulness through all generations. Now, last week we talked about the triumphal entry of Jesus to Jerusalem. Psalm 100 for tonight is a, a thanksgiving psalm, but if you will look at the text, not only is it, is it uh, used, it is using the second temple language because of the nations of the earth mentioned here. It's actually pointing towards the millennial reign, okay, the, uh, the second coming of the Lord and reigning for a thousand years <coughs> on earth. And it is especially noteworthy that this was, this Thanksgiving is offered in gratitude for special mercies. Say special mercies. You know, there are, there are mercies of the Lord that you never ask God, you, you never ask Him for. But they are just made available. And you wonder where these mercies come from. You know, it's amazing when some people think that they deserve the mercies of God. But sometimes the mercies of the Lord will come to you in a wave that is unexpected, and totally undeserved. Then you say, well, why in the world did I get this? But that's just the way it is. That's why uh, Israel doesn't need to be restored to the land, but they were restored to the land. They keep sitting against the Lord. But they kept, after a generation had passed, the Lord keeps working on the new generation. And that's the amazing thing. Uh, uh, generations after generations of Christians, there will be, there will be signs of unfaithfulness. And... And sometimes we look at that and say, well, Israel repented and the Lord forgave them. No, the new generation of Israelis repented and the Lord forgave them because the last generation had missed the blessing of the Lord. But in spite of that, God keeps insisting on his mercy. Now, this, uh, this uh, offering that is brought here for this Thanksgiving offering is what they call as a peace offering, okay? Peace offering is also a gratitude offering. And uh, this peace offering flows, or uh, Thanksgiving offering, flows from all the appreciation that God has done. Now, in our case, that the Lord has done for us in Christ. And so, <clears throat> yes, last night was, well, last night, yesterday, supposed to be Thanksgiving Day. It is supposed to be the counting of the blessings because, because uh, you can either make a list of difficulties or problems or make a list of blessings. And when, when the problems or difficulties in life comes to us, we tend to magnify them. That's why it says, bless the Lord. Make Him big. Because problems have the tendency of making itself big in our lives. Like, you look, you look today, um, the political, the political uh, playground in our country, it, it, is so, it is so chaotic and out, out of the realm of, 
of uh, common sense that you begin to wonder what's going to happen. Well, I'll tell you what's going to happen, okay? Because in the Bible we can see this. The moment a country becomes so corrupt, there is no getting away from it. You know, I think it's, it's, a, uh, it's a wishful thinking to say that, that when the country goes into deep corruption, that it will get out of it. No, it will not. God always raised a new generation that will start afresh. But any generation that becomes so corrupt, it totally destroys itself. And so the hope now comes to the children. But if the children is being corrupted, then sometimes it lasts generations. You know, God visits the sins to the third and fourth generation. That's what it means. Um, Joseph was uh, pointing out to us today because Joel is reading a book from Edgebrook, and it's full of uh, bad language. And uh, he said, we won't even read this kind of book in, uh, in high school. And was it you who pointed out that uh, somebody in a, in a meeting with, with the Board of Education, something like that in their district, read these textbooks? And, and the committee itself said, stop le uh, reading that because it's so foul. And he said, well, this is what you are telling our children to read. You know, that's why, look, look Joel is uh, uh, graduating soon. And, and that's the last of our uh, elementary student. Thank God it's the last. Because the new curriculum that we have is going to brainwash the young Americans and they will have a heavy dose of identity crisis. Mm -hmm. They will never know if they are male or female, if they are a dog or a cat. And, and that is the kind of corruption that has taken place in this country. There is no recovery. I'll, I'll tell you this, you will hear prophets say that it will recover. There is no recovery from this. If you are reading your scriptures, there's no recovery from this. The only recovery is when the Lord raises a new generation. Because when Israel became so corrupt, God has to bypass that generation. This generation of Americans had become so corrupt that God has to bypass. In churches, it's the same. Churches keep praying for revival and a little bit of shouting. They think there is revival. No, revival is turning away from sins. And when a church becomes so compliant with the world, God bypasses a generation and works with the next generation. And sometimes we think that when God bypasses a generation, that God is silent and is not doing anything. No, He is. He is looking for hearts that He can work with. And so that is the overflowing and unexpected mercies of the Lord. Can you imagine a, a generation can be so corrupt and God can pick one or two individuals from the next generation and produce a wave of change and awakening in that new generation that the whole generation can turn its face towards the Lord. And that's why I am very convinced that uh, the next, really the next move of the Lord for it to be very effective has got to involve a full, full swing of the, of the operation of the Holy Spirit. I, I mean, th think about th these guys. Do, do you think this, this generation will be saved through speeches? It's, it's not, we, we have, look, we can take cues from among us. We have people who, who grew up in the church and, and parents think they are very righteous. And then in almost a second notice, Turn around. You know, we have, we have people who have experienced the mercies of the Lord and then almost no warning, just turn around. That's the depth of wickedness. And Israel became like that because before, before the second temple period, Israel was going through different prophetic warnings 
And, and the prophets are saying the same thing, repent, because you're idolaters and adulterers. Those, those are the basic two things. And you don't seek my face anymore. And they kept generations after generation ignoring that, and the generation just kept deteriorating. And then God says, out of here. So they were, the, the northern kingdom was taken by the Assyrians, and then almost 200 years later, the uh, southern kingdom was taken by the Babylonians. And then, of course, here comes uh, Nehemiah and Ezra. Nehemiah rebuilt the temple partially, and then uh, Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. But even then, after that, the people refused to repent. And then here comes, that's why we can relate this specifically to Jesus, here comes Jesus coming uh, in the temple of Herod, which some people call it actually a third temple. And so this psalm <clears throat> closed at a prophetic look at the millennial reign. Now, personally, I'll tell you this, personally, I, I am looking forward to the millennial reign of Jesus. Because this world had lost its center. Okay? It had lost its center. Now, let me ask you this question. Where is your life centered on? Okay? The movement of God, when I, when I say about the centering of your life, it's like a wheel. When you look at a wheel, there is a hub. Okay? And so it will be revolving, it will be moving, but everything is centered on that will. The way the will moves is centered on that, on that hub. You remove that hub, the will will break. Now the thing is this, there is no hub right now in the world. The countries of the earth have lost its center. Individuals have lost its center. Like a personal question, is your life centered in Jesus Christ? If you say your life is centered in Jesus Christ, whatever happened, the hub will be Jesus. And anything that will violate the center, you will disregard and you will get rid of. But when we keep absorbing the elements of this world, ignoring the hub, then your life is not centered on Jesus. Your decisions, my decisions, should be based on that center, and the center is Jesus Christ. Whether in word or in deed, the center should be Jesus Christ. If he doesn't, if he's no longer the center, then your life has no anchor, okay? And nations have no anchor. So first, in the first two verses, it talks about approaching God, because it's important that we don't, we don't uh, religiously approach Jesus, but uh, right now everybody is trying to be politically correct, you know. Uh, I, I walked in and I checked on John because it, it, the, the sound, the tune is the, is the hitman, something like that. You know, that bold guy uh, in the movies, the singing of Ave Maria. Is that the title? And, and so I, I told John, are you worshiping Mary in this church now? You know, because I think she is preparing a special number uh, on the tune of Ave Maria. Well, Maria is not going to be hailed by me. You know, she is a sister in the Lord, and that's about it. At, at one point, she disbelieved Jesus also. So she is a sister, and that's it. And so... John told me, well, well, you know, I changed the lyrics. Instead of Ave Maria, uh, he's going to hail Jesus. Is that correct? You better. Or I'm going to stop that song in the middle of your presentation and you'll be so embarrassed. You will run out of the building, you know. Uh, because our worship should be centered. What if you offend other religions? Forget other religions. Who cares? I'd rather not offend Jesus. By the way, John is my son, you know. But uh, I, can, I can tell him bluntly, you don't do that. Why? Because my life is not centered on John. It's not centered on Anne. Anne can do crazy things. My life is not centered on her. My life is centered on Jesus. It's not centered, centered on my kids. 
it's centered on Jesus. The moment your life is centered on Jesus, the deciding factor becomes Jesus Christ. And so, the purity of our approach to God has to be maintained. First, we see an unrivaled harmony here in the opening verses. Let me, let me read it to you again. Let the whole earth, say the whole earth. The whole earth. Can you imagine? The whole earth shout triumphantly to the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Now people interpret that and say, oh, you, you come to him. It's not talking about individuals. It's talking about the whole earth. That's why this kind of revival, this kind of, this kind of awakening is global. You can only see this in the millennial reign. Um, we can see how, how even the gates of the sanctuary has been opened. You know, there is a limitation uh, that, that is built in the priestly ministry. Okay? You have the outer court, you have the inner court, and you have the Holy of Holies. There is the court of women and Gentiles. And they are combined. And there is the court of men separate from the, um, from the women. I mean, even today in the synagogue, when you come, you see the limitations. The women are up in the balcony with the children. This setup will not work in a Jewish synagogue. The men will be on the main sanctuary. And you cannot enter a Jewish synagogue without uh, uh, the holy hut. Okay. Now, if you don't like the kippah, I don't, I don't wear the kippah because there's nothing to clip it on. You know? I find myself holding it in the western wall because there's, there's just nothing there in, in the middle. You know? So what is acceptable is actually a hat. You can wear a baseball cap. Now, by the way, we are not a synagogue, okay? So please, in our tradition, in the Western tradition, uh, you don't wear those baseball caps. I know some people are trying to be cool. They will wear, wear baseball caps in the church. In our tradition, in our culture, that is disrespectful. Okay? Now, uh, differences in culture. Now, I'm not talking about fashion here in a, in a, in a black church. Uh, you, can, you can see their women parading in their glorious hearts. There is nothing disrespectful to that in a black church. But even those, you will see the men doesn't wear hats. Only the women. Okay? Because, because that is what they are trying to portray from the scriptures. What I'm, what I'm saying is there are limitations. So now, you present a sacrifice to the Lord, because here talking about the sacrifice, you go to the priest, and that's it. The priest says, I'm taking over from here. That's your limitation. And the priest himself has his limitation. He can only look at the curtain of the Holy of Holies. He cannot get in there. The high priest goes in. He's the only one who can go to the Holy of Holies and look at the presence of the Lord. That's the limitation. But even the high priest has limitation. What is his limitation? Once a year. The high priest can't go there every day. Knock, knock. Lord, I'm here. And God says, you'll die. You know, you've got you've to come once a year. There, there is all of these limitations. However, that's why there is, Paul was talking about the walls, the walls of division um, in one of the epistles. The walls of division. That walls of division was there. In fact, they, they, they found those inscriptions in, in the ancient ruins. But Jesus broke all of those walls of division. And we have been given divine access. Amen? 100% access in the inner sanctuary. Now we can approach the presence of God. And because of this, look, all of those limitations... That's why you can understand all the joyful shoutings. You see, the, the problem with, and, and in, the, in the charismatic circle and in the evangelical circle, they, they are putting back these walls of, the, hey, I'm pastor, I talk to God differently. That's a wall of division. 
You, you cannot possibly access the presence of God the way I do. I'm, I'm the pastor here. That's the wall of division that ministers are putting up. Hey, that's a leader. He's got different access to God. That's a wall of division. Jesus removed that. You know, we, we recognize leadership, we recognize anointing, we recognize positions, but we don't attach to it limitations. We don't say, well, pastor says prayers are answered more than mine because he's pastor. No. My prayers are just as answered as yours. And when you say, in Jesus' name, God listens to it uh, just the way he listens to everybody else. You know, well, pastor says more education and more experience. It has no bearing in my access to God. Because my access to God was granted when I received Jesus Christ. And so here, we see the shoutings of the whole earth as if crowning the new king, which is Jesus Christ. Which is Jesus Christ. Now, this includes the Gentile nations. The world will now approach him with gladness, joyful, joyful songs. Joyful noise actually is uh, shoutings or singing loudly. There is, you will find tons of passages in the scriptures for singing loudly. That's why when we gather together, uh, when we gather together and worship the Lord, don't, don't be silent. Thank God for, for uh, the vocal organs that the Lord gave you. you know. Amen. Amen. I mean, uh, some of the wives here, when you worship, you are very timid. But then when you scream to your children or to your husbands, you are not timid at all. You know, what's your problem? And, and some husbands, they are very timid when they come and worship the Lord. But they are not timid at all when they scream at their wives or their children. But here, the worship is with joyful noise. Again, the more, the more literal rendering of that is singing loudly. Say singing loudly. You don't, you don't do sign language in the presence of the Lord. Amen? You, it's, God wants to hear your voices. You know, in, in one of the Psalms, you worship Him with all string instruments and symbols. You, you worship Him with, with, your, with your natural voice. Some people say, well, I have a bad voice. You just, you just actually believe others uh, there is no bad voice before the Lord you just never develop it you know uh, have you have you listened to rock and roll music I mean and some of the other music there, there are very few voices which I personally say this is a good voice you know but actually that is human judgment God receives our praises with joy. And so you have to, you have to exercise your, your voice in worship to the Lord. Serve in, in verse 2 actually uh, can be translated as worship. Again, connected to temple worship. What we see here for the first time is, is the creation of a global center, not only in terms of worship, but in terms of government. Uh, the human... The, the humanity failed in the, in the formation of the League of Nations. Who started the League of Nations? Wilson. Woodrow Wilson. And managed to get remarried in between that time, you know. Uh, and then after that, it failed. You have the uh, United Nations. Who started the United Nations? Yes, Roosevelt. Don't doubt yourself. Uh, and then... The United Nations uh, failed. Who tried to demolish it? George Bush, the second. He failed, you know. <laughs> well, ev everything that uh, the nations of the earth are into alliances. And by the way, we are into alliances. Have you noticed our lives are interconnected and it becomes godly or ungodly alliance? You know, uh, one, one person leaves the church, he has friends. The friends don't care. They just leave the church. Because of what you call as alliances. Some of these are ungodly alliances. You know what that means? Their lives are not centered on Jesus Christ. Yeah. Because if your life is centered on Jesus, 
it will not be determined. Look, strictly speaking, my service to God and my standard should not be determined by my wife or my children. Are you listening? It shouldn't be determined by my wife. If my wife does anything that I don't very much approve of in terms of my relationship with God, I will not go along with it. Yeah. Because my life is never centered on her. It's never centered on my kids. If any of my kids do something foolish that violates my faith, they're on their own. Because my life is centered on Jesus Christ. Now, this is the first time that the world is going to have a center. It never happened before. The first attempt to have a global center took place where? Huh? In Babel, Nimrod, yeah, the Tower of Babel. It wants to create a global center. And then here comes the world empires. Each of these world empires... Uh, the Babylonians, the, the Greco-Macedonians, what, what else? The Romans, what else? The, uh, yeah, wherever they are. You know. uh, they try to create a global center, and they want, they want their empire to be... America tried to be a center. It will never happen, because there are only four world empires predicted in the scriptures. China wanted to be. It's not going to work. British Empire wanted to be. They became very influential in China. Russia tried to be. It's not going to work because it's going to fail. Okay? The last uh, center that will succeed, the, the only center that will, that will succeed is Jerusalem because the king will be Jesus Christ and that will happen here. And so at that point, look, look at this, look, look at our future. At that point, everything will be centered on Jesus. One nation will say something, and they will say, is this what Jesus wants? Which is equivalent to, they will be done. You better get used to it. That is the only question. Egypt will say, let's not pay, uh, let's not pay taxes. Let's not bring our, our, our tithes there. And the Egyptians will be answering, is this the will of Jesus? And the Egypt, Egypt will say, no, it's not, but we don't like it. And uh, the Lord in Jerusalem will say, well, that's what you want. I will not violate your will, but no rain for one year. That's what's going to happen. And the rest of the earth will take notice, and everything will be centered. You know, at one point, uh, uh, global economy uh, is centered on the, the U.S. dollar. Uh, the, the euro dollar was created to fight that. And now China is trying to make their, their currency the center. President Marcos tried to get away from the dollar and uh, stake on his own. Failed, you see, because, because there has to be something that holds everything together. But here, it will happen in the millennial reign. And, and nobody will be, at that point, nobody will be able to do whatever is right in their own sight. When, when your center is right, you will not be able to do whatever is right in your sight. If you are living like, well, this seems right to me, then your center is wrong. You're off-center. Okay? You're off-center. You know, Jesus, the Bible says, uh, is the cornerstone. Yeah. Uh, corners are the coping stone. We, we know what a cornerstone is. It's the strongest rock in a building because... The opposing army will ram against it. And so it will be, it has to be strengthened. Everything is, is, uh, is centered. It's, it may not be in the center, but it's measured against that stone. Okay? It's the strongest stone, measured against the stone. And so our lives, our decisions should be centered on, am I going to do this? Well, what is this? What will be its effect on my relationship with Jesus Christ or on the kingdom of God. And so if we are doing whatever is right in their own sight, and really a lot of our decisions, if we are going to be honest, is not centered on Jesus. It is based on what, what is right in our own sight. 
I'm going to do this because I like this. It's based on what is right in our own sight. If it is based on what is right in our own sight, then it's not centered on Jesus. The world <clears throat> has tried, and now the attempt is globalization. It is failing miserably. But in the psalm, uh, in Psalm 100 specifically, we are looking at a powerful, universally magnetic force that will draw all nations in harmony. Yeah. Uh, any, any world empire can manipulate nations. When uh, Iran was, well, when, when Iraq was very powerful in the Middle East, the U.S. used the Shah of Iran to neutralize Iraq. That's how the center is. U.S. is the center. And then suddenly, the Shah of Iran becomes very unpopular. The Khomeini's took over. And so the U.S. used the Iraqis. That is Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein was a puppet of the U.S. before. That's how they manipulate nations. You see? But in the millennial reign, None like that. Nothing like that. The center will be Jerusalem. The center will be Jesus Christ. Whatever Jesus said, that is going to happen. And so because of that, approaching God requires worship with joy or gladness. Say joy. joy. You see, religion have taught us, and, and by the way, in our daily lives, we like, we like looking pitiful. Why is it that we like looking pitiful? Huh? Because you want to be pitied. Yeah, right? If you, if you try to talk to one of your children and they are wrong, they'll, they'll have this look of feeling sorry. That's why in, in my house, I don't like my kids uh, looking at me with pouty face. You know? I like them smiling. I, you know, especially if they are asking something from me. I want them smiling. <laughs> you know that when your kids ask something from you, it costs money, right? Okay, can you imagine the double-edged sword? It, it's already costing you money and they are pouting at you. Ooh. Knock it off, you know. You want them to approach you with, with smiles. Say with smiles. With smiles. Yeah. Uh, God... God is the same. He wants us to approach his throne with, uh, with joy and with gladness. Gladness is, is inward. We have been studying this series in joy here. In verse 2, coming before him is rendered in other translations, coming before his presence or face. Come before me. Come before my face. I mean, look at my face. You know? If you are rejected by somebody, they don't want to see your face. I mean, do you like to see everybody's face? No? <laughs> there are some faces you don't want to see. They are not welcomed by you. But God is saying, seek my face. What he is saying is you are welcome by me. And so therefore, the true essence of worship, we talk about joy and gladness already, the true essence of worship is actually coming in his face with adoring hearts. Okay, coming to God in His presence and adoring Him. The best picture that we can <coughs> take in the scriptures in Isaiah, when the seraphims, the burning ones, were in the presence, or the, is it, oh no, I think the cherubims, they, they are in the presence of the Lord and they are shouting, holy, 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 for eternity. And with their two wings, their face is covered. The moment they look at the throne of God and they see his face, they could not contain the glory of the Lord. They'll bow down and, and cry out, holy, holy, holy. You know, sometimes we criticize worshipers for saying, for saying praise the Lord. What is that? Praise the Lord. Glory to God. What's that? You know? Because I have, I've, I have been in worship service when, where people last night worship, oh, glory, 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 and we are upset. I mean, glory, 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 and I mean, these angels, they're just saying, holy, 
Holy, holy, holy. And then they recovered. They recover and they begin to lift their face again. And as they lift their face, they see the, 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 the face of God and they prost again for eternity. That's all they're doing. And God doesn't mind. See, God doesn't mind. That's, that's the only vocabulary that they know. You know, they, they are not uh, encyclopedic in their vocabulary. The only word that they know is holy. Can, can you imagine to have such vocabulary? Holy? <laughs> we will say more than that, okay? But, but this is because of the magnificence of the presence of the Lord. At best, at best in the Gentile world, they look at the temple from a distance. They look, at best, the Israelis look at the Holy of Holies from a distance. That's at best. But now we have been summoned into His presence. And each of the worshippers here is confronted with His presence. So now we have to acknowledge the Lord. The Bible says, acknowledge that the Lord, He is God. The companion Bible, uh, acknowledge that, the, that He is Jehovah's self. I like that translation. That he is Jehovah's self. Nations for ages have been steeped in idolatry and false religion. Right now we have, we have all kinds of religion. Uh, Lester Samuel taught a course, Where Was God When World Religions Were Born? I mean, the Roman Catholics have all kinds of divisions. They say that the Roman Catholics has never been split. They have split a hundred times. It just, it's just not obvious. Not, not only have they been split a hundred times, they kill each other uh, uh, a million times. And you have the Augustinian order, the Franciscan order. You have the order of, now there's a new order in Michigan by Father Sirico. I forgot the name of the order. But uh, he, he, is, he is starting a new Catholic order centering on, on social justice. Before this, BLM uh, started. Centering on social justice and evangelism. Okay? So, it's, they have been split. We have, uh, we have uh, again, the Roman Catholics, the Evangelicals are very split. We have the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Anglicans. Um, we have all kinds of, the, all kinds of, very, very split. But when Jesus comes, they'll find out that none of those religions will matter. There will be no Pentecostals in heaven. Although all of them will be on fire, you know. <laughs> I'm glad I'm Pentecostal. Uh, there will be no, especially Baptists, there will be no Baptists in heaven. Yeah, because we have already been baptized. So there's no need for dipping anybody. In fact, there is no need for that that there will be no more sea, you know. So no more sea of Galilee. Uh, no more global religion. These religions that people fight for, they'll be gone. Can you imagine if you are a Calvinist and you are, you are fighting over the Calvinist theology or Armenian? That's going to be totally irrelevant. I told you that Kibuloi is charged by the FBI with with sex trafficking. So what did Kibuloi do? He stood on the pulpit and forgave everybody. I, I don't know whom he is forgiving. <laughs> Maybe he forgave himself, you know. But uh, this, is, this is such a mess because of, of all kinds of religion. But the, the basic and the most fundamental truth that everybody should learn, wherein apart from this, everything else is empty and vain. What is that? The Lord is God. He is Jehovah's self. You know, if, you, if a person recognizes other gods, um, what, what's the name of the thing? The one who replaced, where were we? They replaced the, the image of, of this goddess with Mary. Artemis. Artemis of the, of the, uh, of the Ephesians. He has a, he, she has a big statue in Ephesus. And so what did the Catholics do? Replace it with the image of Mary. Do they, under, do they understand what they're doing? That uh, now Mary is, is their Artemis. You know? 
One of the images, by the way, of this, of this Artemis is she has many breasts. Well, I don't think Mary will appreciate that. But uh, that's what they, we, we try to replace. This is the adjustment that's going on. We are taking what is ungodly in a wrong way and trying to uh, cram it on the Christian throat. Okay na rin yan. Yeah. Well, it's not. It's not. This is a fundamental truth. The Lord is God. Say it with me. The Lord is God. Apart from that, everything is in vain and empty. We have to recognize him, His person. We also need to recognize His power. Look at this. He made us. Okay, He made us. Children, your parents did not make you. God made us. We are His people. We are the sheep of His pasture or His flock. Now, we, we saw this in the nation of Israel. God started a nation through Abraham, and then it was passed on to Isaac, and then to Jacob. After Jacob, to whom was it passed on? To Joseph. What did they do to Joseph? They sold him. Right? They rejected him. But ultimately, they had to return to Joseph. And look at his face. That's the picture of Jesus. The world, especially the, the Israel, rejected him, but ultimately they have to return to him. Because he reigns now. Look, Joseph is reigning in Egypt, and his brothers have no clue that he is reigning in Egypt. Jesus is reigning now, and they have no clue that he is reigning. But ultimately, when their back is against the wall, they have to return to Joseph. That is, they have to return to Jesus. And they will recognize that he is God. That is the only way that Israel was saved during famine. That's the only way that the nation of Israel can be saved right now. Look at Israel right now. Israel is still willing and dealing, trying to dance with the Russians, with the Chinese, with the, with the Egyptians, trying to dance with everybody. It's going to fail. Look at your Bible. It's going to fail because they're, they're trying to make alliances, make themselves a center, offering everybody help. They have perfected the Salinization process, and so Singapore is actually uh, gaining help from, from the Israelis in, in coming up with drinking water. During the mini tsunami in the Philippines, the Israelis sent a rescue mission, and they have this mobile hospital and left it there, left it on the Red Cross. The Philippines were so touched, one Filipina volunteered to fight with the Israelis. She became a member of the IDF. She said, in gratitude to what Israel did. That's what Israel is doing right now. Willing and dealing, trying to make alliances. Well, it's not going to work. None of this is going to work. Because ultimately, the nations of the earth will continue to envy her. It's not going to work. Look, even the alliance that they made with Trump. Trump is no longer president, so now they are, they are having problems. Because the only center that they can possibly go back to is Jesus Christ, their Joseph. Now, some Christians refuse to recognize it also. The center of our lives is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Not, not, look, not even this building. A lot of people are happy to have a building. I'm happy to have a building. But this building does not determine our faith. Jesus Christ determines our faith. You know, some people, they say, well, for as long as they're in the church, they're strong. That means Jesus is never center in their lives. Now, look, I was, I was part of a church since I got born again. My first home church was Kalokan Bethel Temple. It became Manila Bell Temple. It became the Botas Assemblies of God. Back to Manila Bell Temple, it became COP. Rock Church, always. In a ch but wherever I go, I'm part of a church. Then Faith Family, and then we started this church. I'm, I'm, I have never been out of a church. But you know why I'm never out of the church? Because my life is not centered on a building or a denomination. My life is centered in my relationship with Jesus Christ. Look, I should have backslidden. The Assemblies of God rejected my papers. I'm an ordained minister with them, and, and they rejected my papers. They say because I'm Filipino. There's nothing I can do about it. You know, uh, one of the uh, associates 
at uh, Bethesda in Oklahoma because he heard my story he said, well, you know, my, my pastor is assistant, assistant uh, district superintendent here. If you are here, we can do something about that. I did not rush and say, I'll move to Oklahoma, you know. No, <laughs> that person will die, you know. And, and you cannot make decisions on the base of what anybody says. I'm very happy now with, with, with where I am. But I never lost my faith because my faith is centered in Jesus. During my time, the premier evangelist was a guy named Jimmy Swaggart. He committed a sexual uh, problem, you know, and, and adultery and prostitution. Look, I stayed in the faith. One of my uh, young colleagues at Rock Church is charged by the police with soliciting prostitution from a minor. It didn't, you know, one thing that I've noticed this time, when, when Jimmy Swaggart fell and Jim Baker, it shook me up. My faith stayed in Jesus. Shook me. This time when I heard about this, I got disgusted. I just, I just got disgusted. How can people so, be so foolish and wake away from the Lord? But it didn't affect my faith anymore. Why? Because my faith is centered in Jesus. Are you listening to me? I'm telling you guys, my faith is not centered on my wife. It's not centered on my mother. It's not centered on my, on my children. My faith is centered in Jesus. I am not dependent on any of them to stay in faith. Not. What if some of your kids, one of your kids, a backslide? They'll be in hell. But I'll continue to go to heaven. Because my faith is not centered on an individual. It is centered on Jesus Christ. And, and today, we have to examine, because a lot of people, their faith is centered on something else. You've got to center it on Jesus Christ. By the way, we are the sheep of his pasture. A sheep is a very vulnerable and defenseless animal. A sheep cannot defend itself. It needs a shepherd to make sure it stays safe. Therefore, we are likened to a sheep. I need a shepherd for me to stay safe. And thank God, I have found my shepherd, or my shepherd found me. His name is Jesus Christ. And the name of your shepherd is? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed because Joel was reading in the Bible that if, if you confess, if you believe in your heart, right? and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. And, 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 and he took it uh, in faith. And so one day he, he came here and said to me, Papa, Jesus is Lord. I said, yes. And then he said, because it says that if you confess with your mouth, that's a childlike faith. You know, we're in, and he really declares Jesus is Lord. Amen. If Jesus is Lord over your life, he is the center of your life. He's the hub. You know. Jesus is Lord over my life. And so when we, when we approach him properly, then in verses 4 to 5, we appreciate God properly. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. You know, I'm, I'm always blessed. One, uh, well, before the teaching of the word of the Lord, what blessed me the most is worship time. Yeah. What blessed me the most is worship time, that is, when we are worshiping. <laughs> no, not just singing. That's why, that's why you have heard me, maybe some people think I'm too much. But I don't like any worship leader or facilitator taking attention to themselves. Because... We're supposed to seek his face. Every worship facilitator is supposed to point us to Jesus Christ. True, I, I thought, I th it's too bad I, I, di I, I did not remember his name. But this American tenor came to Rock Church. He's got a cancer in his uh, throat and he's got a couple of months to live. And so he would not even talk. 
But before the speaker came, he approached, and I saw him in the pulpit, he approached Bishop John Chimnes, and he wanted to sing. And he told us this before he sang, he said, <coughs> I'm dying anyways. He said, so, I might as well sing my last songs for Jesus. So he said, please indulge me, I would like to give a special worship song to the Lord. And he sang this song, Give Thanks. And so instrumentalist approached right away and they wanted to accompany him with their music. He said, no need, he said. And he just sang, give thanks with his tenor voice. And when I heard it, immediately as he sang, it invited my spirit to worship. I hope you understand this. It, it enjoined my spirit to worship. And I have noticed it enjoined the whole congregation to worship. And so without further encouragement as he was singing, give thanks, the congregation just starts singing, sitting down. So I said, oh, please, by all means, join me. And, and the whole congregation without musical instruments just arrived in worship. I will never forget the experience. All of us were drawn to Jesus. I enjoyed worship when uh, we are all drawn to Jesus. Amen. Amen. When, the, when the presence of the Lord eliminates all obstructions. Amen. How do you know that your worship is not centered on Jesus? Because you are paying attention to everything else. Amen. Yeah. Oh, why, why is it that the light there is not turned on? You know, why, why is it that that worship uh, leader, by the way, it should be worship facilitator. That worship facilitator is not wearing the right color, you know. Uh, and so now your attention is no longer centered on Jesus. You are now paying attention to the people. And sometimes worship facilitators can have that attraction also. They want people to look at them. So they hate it when people erupt in worship. They want the people to to march in the beatings of their drums. You know, that when people begin to be raptured in the presence of God, they don't like it because they're not leading it. How about being led by the Holy Spirit? You know, there will be order. I'll make sure of that. If something goes out of whack, I'll have to put the correction to it. But we should enjoy a time of worship before the Lord. Amen? Because the Lord, he is God. Look, give thanks to him and bless his name. Part of our worship, we come here. L last night I was blessed because of the phenomenal testimonies that, that we heard. You know, a couple of people really went off track. Uh, and, but but it's, uh, it's, I think it's our limitation because we, we failed to say, let's have a time limit in, uh, in testimonies, you know. And... Uh, and I have been telling you this, I love testimonies that focuses on Jesus. Jesus did this, Jesus did that to me, Jesus blessed me with this. Focus on Jesus, not, not focus on self, because the center of our faith is Jesus Christ. Amen? Uh, Pat Robertson wrote, rewrote, uh, revised his book, Shout It From The Housetops. Uh, I've read the book two or three times. Now it's revised. I like the title. I Walk with the Living God. That's the title of his book. Phenomenal book. I Walk with the Living God. And I, I've read most of it already because I, I know the story. But I like the theme. So I, I look through the, the preface, the foreword, and in the end, he is really emphasizing, I was able to do all of this. Because I walked with the living God. Pat is saying in his old age, I think he's in his 90s, the reason why I'm able to accomplish all of this is because the center of my life is Jesus Christ. I walked with the living God. I mean, he has interviewed presidents after presidents, has been a confidant with some of the top politicians, a, a, a very good friend of Menachem Begin, and, and even Netanyahu is a good friend of his. But he said, I, I'm able to do all of this because I walked with the living God. 
you know, can, 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 we, can we attest to that? Can it be our testimony that, that in spite of all the difficulties that we go through in life, we can say, well, I, I won because I walked with the living God. Amen. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, sidestep, I sidestep sometimes, but at the end, I walk with the living God. And when you say, I walk with the living God, He is the center of my life. Jesus is Lord over my life. That's, that's the ultimate appreciation that we can show to Him. We appreciate His goodness. Look at this. His faithful love through all generations. You know, look, look at this. You, appre you, you appreciate your, His faithful love and goodness through all generations. How is that possible? Think, think for a moment. How can you appreciate His goodness and faithful love through all generations when you can only live in one generation? I can only live in my generation. How in the world can you appreciate His goodness and faithful love through all generations? Because you passed it on. And so, you appreciate Appreciate fully the goodness of the Lord. It's evident that you're able to pass it on to your children. And you are blessed because you see your children get married to godly spouses. And so you see their, their children, your grandchildren. And by the way, the Bible doesn't use the word grandchildren. It's children, you know. Uh, biblically, the first child of my son, Joseph, when he gets married, is mine. Biblically, you know. I'm going to name that boy. Better be a boy, you know. Uh, <laughs> so I can, I, can, I can biblically name that boy. Yeah. Because biblically, that is mine. Yeah. And uh, it will carry on the faith. And so you can worship God and declare his goodness and faithful to all generations because you pass on the faith. If the gratitude is only to me, I become unfaithful. Because if I am not able to pass that gratitude of his goodness and faithful love to my kids, if I can't pass it on, I have failed. Because you declare his goodness to all generations. Amen? Amen. Now, uh, Joseph will get married. And the reason why I'm pointing on Joseph is because he's too slow. You know, uh, So Joseph will get married. And... And he will pass on the faith. The faith that I passed on. And so his kids will declare the goodness of God. That's why we parents, we should, we should be mindful. Don't tell your kids you're so good and you're so competent that you're able to get promoted or you are able to get all of these goodies in your life. You should be mindful of what comes out of your lips. You should make it known and declare to them, we have what we have, I am what we are, I am, because God is good. And He is faithful. And it gets entrenched in their beings. So they repeat that. And, and, and it will be a joy when you begin to realize that your kids started digesting it and they begin to say without compulsion, God is good. Amen, DJ? Amen. Be because kids nowadays, they become full of hot air. They think they are so smart and so talented. You know, they, some of you are into Facebook and YouTube, likes and dislikes. How many likes? Who cares about that? What if Satan put a like there, you know? You are, you are looking for man's, man's approval. But a person whose life is centered on Jesus begins to realize that we have it good because God is good. Amen. We never fail because love never fails because of his faithful love. Guys, do you realize it? You can never fail. Why? Because love never fails. That's in my Bible. If it's in your Bible, then... Love never fails. Amen? Amen? There is no failure in the household of faith. 
No failure here. Well, I, amen. Well, I made this mistake. You made a mistake, but you're not a failure. Why? Because love never fails. Well, I keep committing errors. Yeah, you did. But love never fails. And so when you begin to have that appreciation for his goodness and faithful love, you can never fail. Well, if you want to fail, it's up to you. You can never fail. Now, this, this uh, generational gratitude includes those generations in the past that did not recognize him and appreciate him. When we influence other people, whereas before they are not giving gratitude to God, ultimately you will influence them and they will. I told you about my, my mother. We, got all, we all got born again. And so she was witnessing to one of my aunts. The name is, uh, I forgot. You know. <laughs> uh, I'm, I don't want to mention the name because I may mess it up. But it starts with letter D. Yeah. But uh, my mother told me, by the way, when, when she got persecuted, she never told me. She never told me this. This was decades ago. That uh, my aunt persecuted my mother and outcast her because she is of the faith now. She never told me. You see, if your life is centered on Jesus, you don't go pity party. But then her son got born again and entered the ministry. And so when my uncle got, when my uncle died, they have to bury him, of course, they saw each other. And this aunt of mine, my mother told me this, came to see her and profusely apologized because now they recognize the goodness of God in my family's life. Now my, my family made a lot of mistakes, but I'm telling you the most educated family in my clan is my family. Yeah. None of them surpass the education of my family. And in my family, my clan, my, from my father, my family is the most educated. The, the Lord had blessed us. Amen. And my kids are the most good looking in Jesus' name. You know. <laughs> the Lord is good. And so the generation will look at you and they thank God. Amen. So when you come to the house of the Lord, you should sing to him with joyful noise. Amen. Don't, don't do lip sync. No, no. Somebody make a mistake and give you a piece of chocolate, you know. Uh, yeah. And they think that you need to put it. Yes. Well, I have to stop. I, I may say something else. Did you learn something tonight? Basically. <laughs> Let's understand.